are going to be delivering a lecture on Girish Kannad's play Tugla. This will be an introductory lecture to make you aware of the important aspects of the play. In this lecture, I shall be dealing with Girish Kannad, his life and life and work. I will give a short introduction to Tugla, the composition and the theatricality of the play. I will discuss on the plot and characters of the play. and then i will talk about the three decisions of mohammed bin tughlaq number 1 the new agrarian tax system that he introduced number 2 the transfer of capital and number 3 the introduction of copper currency girish kannar was born on may 19 1938 at matheran the then bombay presidency that is now located in maharashtra india and died on june 10th 2019 in bangalore karnataka he was a renowned indian playwright author actor and film director whose move, movies and plays written largely in kannad explored the present by the way of the past after graduating from the karnataka university in 1958 kannad studied philosophy politics and economics as a road scholar at the university of oxford from 1960 to 1963 he wrote his first play yati and uh, it was critically acclaimed in 1961 while still at oxford centered on the story of a mythological king that play established kannad's use of the themes of history and mythology and would inform his work over the following decades Kannad's next play Tughlaq composed in 1964 tells the story of the 14th century sultan Muhammad bin Tughlaq and this work remains among the best known of his works the other works of Girish Kannad are the following Haya Wadana or the horse head composed in 1971 Anzu Malige the driven snow 1977 Hitinja Hunja Dao Roster in 1980 Naga Mandala or the Circle of the Serpents in 1988 Tale Danda Death by Decapitation in 1990 Agni Mattu Malle English translation is The Fire and the Rain 1994 He also wrote Tipu Sultan Kanda Kanashu or The Dreams of Tipu Sultan in 2000 and most recent work is bali the sacrifice tukluk as a play is composed in 1964 is an indian kannad play written in kannad language written by girish kannad this is a 13 scene play set during the reign of mohammed bin tukluk it was written in kannad and then translated into urdu and staged in 1966 as a student production at the national school of drama most famously it was staged at purana killa new delhi in 1972 in 1970 it was reenacted in english in mumbai tughlaq is a 13 scene play written by kannad focusing on the 14th century turko indian ruler the play is both a historical play as well as a commentary on the contemporary politics of 1916 girish kannad uses historicization as a tool to use a popular tale from history in order to represent a contemporary story and comment on the present in the play the protagonist mohammed bin tughlaq is portrayed as having great ideas and a grand vision but his reign was an abject failure he started his rule with great ideals and wanted to make a large empire unified india but this gradually degenerated into anarchy and his kingdom gradually got destroyed if you look at the compositional history of girish kannad's tughlaq you will find that kannad's his own account of the genesis of tughlaq gives an important clue while studying at oxford university as a road scholar in the early 1960s girish kannad felt 
challenged by the verdict of a noted Kannar critic, Kritinath Kurkati, that modern Kannar drama had no first-rate historical play and gradually he began to compose and think about a process of writing a history play, a history play that can be used as a process of self-education in the Indian context. Thus the pre-modern Indian history that can offer a possible solution to the contemporary issues. This discovery of Muhammad bin Tughlaq as an elementary textbook motivated Kannar to take on the full range of historiographic material available at Oxford, which in turn led to a series of revelations about the uncanny persistence of the past in India. In 1971 interview, Kannar himself recalls that Tughlaq stuck him, I quote, as quotation, the most idealistic, the most intelligent king ever to come to the throne of Delhi, including the Mughals, who nevertheless ended as, I quote again, one of the greatest failures, unquote, because of the contradictions within Tughlaq's personality and the self-defeating nature of his politics. The 20-year period of Tughlaq's decline as a ruler also had a striking parallel to the first two decades of Indian independence under the rule of Prime Minister Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and his idealistic leadership that was also troubled. Nehru appeared remarkably like Tughlaq according to Girish Kannad in his propensity for failure despite an extraordinary intellect. Yet the play was not meant either as an obvious comment on Nehru or as an exact parallel to the present rather than it commented on the past. The play addressed the emerging ambivalence of power relations in political and public spheres that were based for the first time in Indian history on the principles of mass representation and enfranchisement. Thus we find that Kannar's own comment on the play gives us an important clue about the compositional aspect of the play. Kannar himself observed that the play reflected, I quote, the play reflected the slow disillusionment my generation fell with the new politics of independent India and gradual erosion of the ethical norms that had guided the movement for independence and the coming to terms with cynicism and real politics. Among the influences that Kannar identifies at that time when the play was being composed, we have works like Anio Lutz, Beckett, Albert Camus' Caligula, Bertolt Brecht's Galileo, the history plays of William Shakespeare, even movies of Sergei Eisenstein. The principal structural model of Tughlaq was not Western because the play is not set as a five-act play. It was rather Indian and the popular Indian tradition that Kannad used and he sought a large audience in the theatre to make the play a popular historical play. But because as an Indian student in England writing a Kannad play, he discounted the possibility of performance altogether. He never thought of putting even the first play, Yayati, on the stage. When he was writing about the second play, he, th he thought that the same fate would meet the play. And so he planned to write a play on a grand scale, a play involving about, about characters drawn from history, the speciousness of the stage and the overall design and conventions of the Indian historical play, especially drawn from the partial theatrical tradition. Therefore, allowed Kannar to innovate on a genre that was both Indian and Western. Like Shakespeare's historical play, it could use the historical source material to present a grand operatic representation of a story. 
the especially opulent historical spectacular that Kannad had a thorough knowledge could then convert the Kannad regional theatre into a grand contemporary company natak like the Parsi commercial theatres that were very popular in the Bombay presidency. In 1989 essay, Girish Kannad commented that the basic special division that ordered the socially unequal none to subtly delineate the world of the popular history play. The stagecraft of the Parsi theatre demanded a mechanical succession of alternating shallow and deep scenes. The shallow scenes were played in the foreground of the stage with a painted curtain at the backdrop and these scenes were reserved for the lower class characters with prominence given to comedy. This play is a play of mixed genre. They served as a link scenes in the development of the plot but the main purpose was to keep the audience engaged while the deep scenes which showed interiors of palaces, royal parks and such other visually opulent sets were being changed or decorated. The important characters could thus appear in the scenes, in the street scenes and in the crowd scenes and these characters could therefore communicate with the audience from the lower space. The special division was thus ideal to show the gulf between the ruler and the ruled, between the mysterious inner chambers of power politics and the open public areas of those affected by it. Kernel concedes, however, that in actual process of writing, this distinction between the deep and the shallow on the stage became impossible to sustain. The comic scenes gathered an uncontainable energy, while the serious scenes became gradually emptier and the place two worlds drew even closer to each other until they merged in the final scene. Therefore, the play requires a close concentration on the inner room scenes, the chambers, with major focus on the dialogues, while in the crowd scenes, it is a focus on the multitude of characters that are present on the stage. The text that I am using today is this collected plays of Girish Kannad, and I will be talking about the characters and plot. In the list of dramatists personally, we have the following characters. Tukluk, Muhammad bin Tughlaq, the historical character. Then we have Azam, Aziz. We have Tughlaq's stepmother. We have Nazib. We have Barani. Then Sheikh Imam Uddin. We also have Shaib Uddin, Ratan Singh, Sheikh Samsuddin. Then we have Gyas Uddin Abbasid. And the play that was done in English was directed by Alak Padmashi, set designed by Puchhanwala and music by Karsi Lord. This Tuklak was first presented in English by the theatre group of Bombay at the Babubhai Desai Auditorium in August 1970 with a cast. Kabir Bedi performed the role of Tukla, while we have Stanley Pinto and Bubbles Padmisi performing the role of Azam and Aziz. As the play opens, we find that the audience is introduced to the court of Muhammad bin Tughlaq, a Muslim Sultan Emperor. emperor. Tughlaq declares that he is shifting his capital from Delhi to Dalatabad. That place was also known as Deogiri, a Hindu populated area. Dalavatabad is in the southern part of India and at a long distance from Delhi. Tughlaq had two purposes in mind behind this decision. First, he thought that it will help him to rule over southern part of India, thereby expand his empire effectively and increase fraternity and unity among the Hindus and the Muslims as Dalazabad was then a Hindu majority city. Second intention was that it will help him saving his capital against 
the attacks of Mongols and the, from the north as Delhi was subjected to such attacks during that time. A man named Aziz appears in the court. In fact, Aziz has changed his identity from a Muslim to a Hindu with a definite purpose. Tughlaq is well known for his secular values. So despite being a Muslim Sultan, Tughlaq shows a great heart towards the Hindus. He desires himself to be seen as an idealist who wants a unity between the Hindus and the Muslims. In order to win hearts of Hindus, he favors Hindus more in his decisions and policies. So Aziz takes this opportunity and he disguises himself as Vishnu Prashad, a Hindu Brahmin. He has filed a case against the Sultan Tughlaq for acquiring his land unfairly. And in the play that proceeds, we find that Tughlaq offers him a possible retribution. And according to the case, the Sultan Tughlaq, who is blamed of acquiring his land, this Vishnu Prashad is given a handsome amount on the name of the land acquisition. Later in the play we find that his court, he invites the public to get settled in Dalatabad. He invites everyone to accompany him. He doesn't force the public. He says that it is not an order but just an honest request from the emperor and allows them to decide on their own whether they will accompany him to Dalatabad or remain in Delhi. Aziz and his friend Azam plans to cheat people and get money on the way to Dalatabad. The scene then shifts as now to Tughlaq is seen playing chess in his private chamber. His stepmother appears. She is quite concerned about his eccentric approach in the administration. It is also revealed that Tughlaq has murdered his father and his brother in the past to get the throne. The mother scolds him for his negligence towards a uprising led by An ul Mulk, an old friend of Tughlaq. An ul Mulk has now turned hostile and is marching with his 30,000 soldiers to attack the state. On the other hand, Tughlaq has only 6,000 soldiers. If the battle takes place, Tughlaq's defeat is quite certain. His stepmother therefore asks Jiauddin Barani, a historian and an assistant, assistant to Tughlaq, to keep Tughlaq away from the company of foolish advisors and counselors. Sheikh Imam Uddin, another notable character, appears on the stage. He doesn't like the Sultan at all. In fact, he incites the people against Tughlaq for his eccentric decisions. Tughlaq himself is well aware of the fact that Sheikh has ill desires against him. Tughlaq calls him and asks the Sheikh to be dressed as a royal person and is mounted on an elephant and sent to meet this An ul Mulk. Tughlaq calls him and asks him to visit An ul Mulk with a proposal of peace. Sheikh is asked to be dressed as a royal person as is sent on the back of an elephant. Tughlaq has done this with a purpose. Later we know when the news comes that Sheikh Mahmuddin is murdered. He was mistaken for Tughlaq by the enemies for his royal dress and as he was riding on an elephant. Ratan Singh in the play comes and reveals that it was Tughlaq's plot. This incident comes as a first instance of the dark side of his character. Ratan Singh, Amirs and the Saeeds of Delhi, they all plan together to murder the Sultan. A conspiracy plan to assassinate the Sultan takes place as they think that there is no one, no other way left for them to stop the foolish acts of the emperor. They argue about Dalatabad city and its Hindu majority population. They pursue 
Shihabuddin to join them. They tried to persuade him, but he hasn't made up his mind yet. They plan to murder him during the prayer. Later the plan, plan is revealed and they are all caught and are forced to die. Tughlaq orders for the dead bodies to be hanged in public as a shock. He takes another ridiculous decision to have currency minted on copper. This is the second decision taken by Tughlaq. The currency to be minted on copper and brass metals, adding more to his foolishness. He declares that all coins will have an equal value, no matter whether the coin is made of gold, silver, copper or brass. He also announces to ban prayers. Even people now start turning him as a mad and foolish sultan. Now Tughlaq wants to shift people to Dalatabad and this becomes very problematic. On the way many people die of hunger, starvation, disease. Aziz and his friend Azam exploit the situation and make fool of others to extract money. The scene then shifts to Dalatabad and it is reported that Nazib, the confidante and the advisor of Tughlaq is murdered. The stepmother comes and scolds him that the economy of the state is in total collapse. The people are, mostly the Hindus, are minting so much fake currency on the copper and brass and they are exchanging that from the state exchequer for gold and silver. So for his foolish decisions, he is held accountable, accountable for the crisis. But Tughlaq is frustrated by Nazi's murder. So many people, whoever he suspects, are gradually executed one by one. Finally, it is revealed that Nazib was poisoned none other than by Tughlaq's own stepmother. When Tughlaq comes to know about this, he orders her arrest and she is punished and stoned to death. All such decisions are presented as severe frustrations of Tughlaq's mind. Then it is announced that public can again resume prayer after the arrival of Gyasuddin Abbasid. Once this prophet arrives, the ban on the prayer will be lifted. The people are no way interested in it as they are dying of hunger. The life of common man is devastated. Tughlaq gradually prepares for Gyasuddin's Abbasid's welcome. Aziz appears in the scene and gets hold of Gyasuddin Abbasid. Aziz murders him and disguises himself as Gyasuddin Abbasid and with a motive to fudge the Sultan. Aziz manages to deceive Tughlaq with his new identity. Later, in the play, Azam is murdered and somehow his true identity is revealed to Tughlaq. We see how these imposters, fictional characters invented by Girish Kannad, incorporated in the historical play befool Tughlaq. Now Aziz tells him everything that has happened, whatever he had done in the past to teach Tughlaq. The revelation of these facts really impressed Tughlaq and he appoints him in a powerful position in the court in instead of giving him punishment. So we find that in the play, towards the end, Tughlaq is left alone, isolated and in a mere distress. In the play we have three major decisions taken by Tughlaq and these three decisions are contrary to the expectation of the general public. It follows the chronology of Tughlaq's reign very closely and the play mixes the historical and the fictional characters with the style of Brechtian epic theatre. The play produces a grand spectacle of the history and 
particularly the well suited to the overall engagement and presented as a historical play the play also appropriates a specific historiographic intertext so we have the historian barani in the play the court historian ziauddin barani using barani's basic narrative his attributes and his portion of his text kanna therefore arranges the 13 scenes of tughlaq as a sequence of self cancelling action in an episodic manner that articulates both the political and psychological ironies politically the play shows tughlaq's failure his futile attempt to be just as liberal towards a majority hindu population that he is obliged as a muslim ruler to persecute persecute in the first scene so it is set in 1327 tughlaq invites his subject to celebrate the new system of justice which works without any consideration of might or weakness or religion or creed and gradually we find that the only character to benefit from this utopian move is a washerman of the lower class a muslim aziz who assumes the identity of a poor hindu brahmin to win and gets judgment in favor of himself he impersonates the identity of a poor hindu brahmin to win a false judgment against the sultan and secure a position at court he imposed higher taxes for the duab land that means the land in the riverine bed of the ganges and the jamuna these tracts of fertile agricultural land mostly owned by the hindus the measures taken by the local tax collectors were often too harsh and even during the drought the farmers were forced to pay high taxes so instead of a tax reform tax penalties became higher thereby causing much anxiety to the common people the second step taken by tughlaq that we find in the first scene itself is the announcement of his decision to shift his capital from delhi to deogir or daulatabad a city of city around 800 miles away from delhi located on the deccan plateau this preference for daulatabad is because tughlaq thinks that daulatabad is a city of the hindus and as a capital it will be a symbol of the fraternity between the hindus and the muslims it will symbolize a bond religious bond which he wishes to develop and strengthen in his kingdom this reasoning so alienates provincial muslim noblemen and religious leaders that they plot to assassinate tughlaq and all the tughlaq foils the coup in the palace he reconceives the move to the deccan as an act of vengeance upon the people of delhi the collective journey to daulatabad becomes a nightmare of starvation disease and death scene 6 and 7 present this journey towards daulatabad and when the action resumes in daulatabad after a five year interval in scene 8 tughlaq subjects are hardened to a life of loneliness punishment and traumatic violence at the end tughlaq is left to contemplate in dismay the famine rebellion and the economic chaos that signal the collapse of his empire from scenes 9 to 13 the second level irony in the play uncover tughlaq sadistic manipulative impulse and undercuts his image of himself as an exemplary ruler so 
from act from scene two to scene four, we have the development of these ironies, gradual ironies, what he intends and what actually turns out, and his position among his friends, his adversaries, and his incestuous stepmother, the historian Barani, and his relationship with Tughlaq is also disturbed. There is a powerful but credulous religious rivalry, even among the Muslims. Sheikh Mahmuddin is a rival. So Tughlaq's real enemies are both within the court and outside. And we have a real nemesis of Tughlaq, an inverted double. The psychodrama, however, presents Aziz after his initial coup pairs up with the childhood friend Azam to subvert all of Tughlaq's well-intentioned move. During the journey to Dalatabad, Aziz appears as a Brahmin disguised to exhort money from the sick and the dying travelers. So Tughlaq's attempt to revive the imperial economy by issuing copper coins with the same token value as the gold and silver, Aziz again becomes a counterfeiter. In a last despairing attempt to bring peace and legitimacy to his reign, Tughlaq invites Gyasuddin Abbasid, a descendant of Baghdad Khalifas, Caliphs, to visit and sanctify the new capital. But Aziz, now a high man robber, murders Gyasuddin and supplants him himself in the, in the palace. Tughlaq has been left entirely alone at the time he confronts the imposter. His stepmother has been stoned to death for poisoning the Prime Minister Nazib. And Barani has used his own mother's death as an excuse to leave the court. Therefore, at the end of the play, we have a haunted and exhausted Tughlaq acknowledging that he cannot punish Aziz because Aziz displays his failures and Aziz is his only future companion and his true loyal disciple. Connor's explanation for this mingling of discrete worlds of political and topical, the fiction and the historical and the violation of the traditional sacred spatial hierarchy can be seen in the play. So he could do little at the end of the play and at the end we have Tughlaq as a broken man waiting for history, waiting for the posterity to judge whether whatever he did was right or wrong. Thank you very much.